Throughout history, the mere mention of certain names can evoke strong emotion from the masses. Icons such as Martin Luther King Jr., Elvis Presley, Mother Teresa. Yet, in the year 2024, there is one name that evokes such emotion from Bobby Fulton and Dylan Hines, it is immeasurable. And that name is... Ken Zubin. Look, look, uh, look, 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 I'll tell you about Ken Zubin. On this special edition of the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast, Ken Jugan tells all. This is like moving on the trashy side of town. Look at what we have here, folks. To the only show that matters. The queen of the crop. Duke loves wrestling. And there is no one that does it better than your host. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. The Duke. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Brothers and sisters, oh my goodness, we got a special one for you here. The Duke is so excited that the eight-year anniversary of the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast is upon us. In fact, next week we're going to be doing all of the uh, festivities, so we'll have some surprise guests and people will be sending in their voicemails. Of course, you can send me any messages that you have. Duke Loves Wrestling at gmail.com if you want to uh, express yourself about the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast and how you feel about the past uh, eight years and the anniversary and what have you here. But anyway, I am going to conclude year seven with a bang, okay? Because the guest that I have to kick off this episode has taken the world by storm. I mean, legitimately, he is one of the most requested guests in the history of this show, in over seven years, close to eight years, we have never gotten so many requests. And what's crazy is that his name was mentioned for the first time just a couple of weeks ago. So the fact that there is such a high demand <laughs> for this individual just speaks to how legends can be born. And certainly that's the case with this guy here, okay? Because as you know, <laughs> we had a crazy episode. Uh, with uh, Dylan Hines and, and his father, Bobby Fulton of the Fantastics. And everything was going one way at first. And then I mentioned a name. And when I mentioned that name, all hell broke loose. That is literally when the conversation shifted and, and folks really started cussing. And eventually, you know, Unfortunately, Dylan and Bobby got into a little uh, fight with each other and what have you, all because the name was mentioned. And I'm going to tell you right now, I just, you know, I left it where it was, but I got so many messages from all of you great listeners, uh, folks who've been listening to the show for years, folks who were listening to the show for the first time. So I said, okay, well, let me figure this out. So I reached out and we've been talking a little bit and we decided, you know what, this is the right time to bring on the man known as Ken Zubin. Well, I just want to tell you, it's a pleasure to be able to come on there and give my side of the story and some history and background on Bobby Fulton and the controversial Dylan Hines. Well, before we even get to that, first and foremost, how does it feel to be the man, the myth, the legend known as Ken Zubin? How does that feel, brother? Well, it's uh, amazing because I've only used my real name to wrestle for, uh, back then it was WWWF. I guess it was like 82, 83. I went up and did jobs for... Uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, and Hamburg, Pennsylvania. In between, I had always worked as either Zoltan the Great, the Great Zoltan, or Lord Zoltan. And I was currently wrestling for Dick the Bruiser in Indiana, WWA. 
and also for the original Sheik up in the Michigan and Ohio areas. But since they did the TV tapings on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, it gave me some free nights because by then uh, Sheik and Bruiser's territories were sort of on the downhill swing. So they were only running possibly Thursday through Sunday. So every three weeks, well, they would tape every three weeks in Allentown and Hamburg back then. And uh, it gave me the opportunity to go up there and uh, do some TV and work with some of those guys. And uh, I was always worried because I barely weighed 200 pounds. But back in those days, it was a big monster hill days, you know, like that they were feeding Bruno and Bob Backlin. And because I had even known where Randy Poffo and, uh, well, Randy Savage and Lanny had gone up there. And they sent Randy home because he was too small, which I was worried when I went up there. But I had been on the athletic commission here in Pennsylvania and was refereeing. So I made sure the guy that booked me, uh, well, they always booked us through Gorilla Monsoon would, would contact, you know, local Pittsburgh guys to come up to do TV. And I told him to make sure he tells Monsoon that I was coming because I didn't want to go up make the trip, which was like four to five hours from Pittsburgh and get sent back home. But uh, my first match up there, I wrestled Tito Santana and we had such a good TV match that he, he put me over and praised me in the dressing room so much that then they brought me back every three weeks for the TV for uh, two years. And then, uh, then I finally quit going once I was, you know, getting more, more activity all over the place. And, I had uh, taken a regular job then, too, because I seen too many of the big names that made big money, like in Madison Square Garden in Toronto and other places struggling as they got in their older years. So I did, I never wanted to end up like any of those guys. So in addition to wrestling for over 40 years, I also kept a regular 8-4 to four job with the uh, District Court Administration here in Pittsburgh. That's a hell of a history there. So, I mean, I I, I know that um, under your Lord Zoltan gimmick, I mean, you go all the way back to the 70s, right? Yeah, I started in 75 managing and then, uh, well, I I never really wanted to be a wrestler. I, I was writing stories for the magazines and uh, taking, you know, photos at the matches and uh, I also had fan clubs for Larry Zabisco, Greg Valentine, uh, who Louis Martinez, who taught me a lot about the psychology in wrestling. But then one night, uh, yeah, I'd help set up the ring and fool around the ring a little bit. And one night, somebody didn't show up, and they said, "Well, you're going to have to take their place." I said, "Well, I don't wrestle. I don't have no boots or trunks." They said, "Well, we'll." We'll fix you up. So they gave me boots and trunks, and I had my first match done in uh, Clarksburg, West Virginia. And uh, you know, I did pretty good, and they asked if I wanted to come back the next week. And I said, well, it was it was easier money than writing stories because back then you're lucky you'd get, you know, one story or article printed in the magazines maybe, you know, each month or whatever. So, you know, it was more of an opportunity to make money. And there were no wrestling schools back in those days. So it was like on-the-job training, you know, as you went. And I would take, then after that, I got to meet, you know, other guys, network with other wrestlers that came into the West Virginia area. Because back then, we were considered uh, outlaw or bootleg groups. It, indie, indie wrestling wasn't even thought of back then. These were groups that were running against like the main territories and you know wwf wwe back then and uh well it's like you know it's once you work for the outlaws you figure there's no way you're ever going to work for any of the major groups but yeah i managed to get in yeah, anywhere i you know like sort of applied it was no oh there was like no tv or anything back then other than the local territories so it's not like now or you know you're on you're nationwide so it was a little harder to get in. It was mostly, I don't even think I sent any VHS tapes back then to anyone. It was just meeting someone, you know, in a different town, and then they would ask you to come for them. Like I met Dick the Bruiser in Lancaster, Ohio. He'd come in for a show. And same with the Sheik. I met him in Ohio and 
uh, Crybaby Cannon up in Michigan and just, you know, working for them once or twice. And then I traveled a lot with Dominic Danucci and uh, Louis Martinez. So, you know, I learned a lot from them too. Just, you know, riding in the car, a lot of that uh, knowledge, you know, can't, can't be learned at any school. Oh, certainly not. And listen, I mean, it's it's ironic because for a guy named <laughs> to be recognized by uh, Pro Wrestling Illustrated, you know, they said that you have one of the most unusual gimmicks in pro wrestling. And for a guy who is revered and well-known and celebrated for being the founder of the Deaf WrestleFest, I mean, goodness gracious, you you received a uh, prestigious honor from the Cauliflower Alley Club, the Humanit- Humanitarian Award. You are a guy that is the complete opposite of... I'm moving on the trash is down the town. So, so you, <laughs> you, you've <laughs> been... You, you have been uh, characterized in a certain way by Dylan Hines and, and, and Bobby Fulton on this show. And folks... Brothers and sisters out there, you know how I am. Anyone who's mentioned on this show, I always say, you're welcome to come on the show and provide a rebuttal for anything that is said about you. And absolutely, through the years, people have taken me up on that offer. In fact, that's why Dylan and Bob, you were on the show. So, Ken, let's just jump right into it, man, because, again, you're a pretty well-accomplished person. You've done a lot of great work in wrestling. You're, You're revered in the Pittsburgh area, one of the most important independent wrestlers in the history of Pennsylvania. And I'm not saying that because that's my opinion. That's what's been written about you. That's official record. So how did we get to the point where just the mention of your name caused? Look, look, uh, look, 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 look. I'll tell you about Ken Jubin. To, you know, (laughs) just, just, I mean, that, that sound, I'm going to play this for like the rest of this, the history of this show going (laughs) forward. Anytime something exciting happens, Folks are going to hear Ken Zubin because I just have to do it. So, so <laughs> right now, once and for all, we need you to tell us about Ken Jugan. So, so hit it right there, Kenny. What is the conflict with Dylan Hines? Yeah, I don't know what what their hatred or animosity is towards me. I, in fact, I started Bobby Fulton in Clarksburg, West Virginia. We were pen pals in the magazines, and he used to wrestle in his backyard. And the Sheik and Frank Curry ran shows in Ohio, but neither one of them would recognize him or give him an opportunity to work for them. And like I said, there were no schools back in those days, so it was, you know, teach yourself. Well, we started corresponding, and uh, we were running shows down in Clarksburg, West Virginia. I was just starting out, too. I started in 75. I think he started like 78, 79, somewhere in that area, I told him to come on down, and I had another friend, Joe Shedlock, who used to have a newsletter, he ended up wrestling as Mad Dog Michaels, and we put them two in the ring together, and they ended up having one of the best matches on the show, but prior to that, uh, Fulton was so young that the guy that handled the ring, Chief Don Redclyde, he made Fulton's father sign a release that if Bobby got hurt in the ring. He wouldn't be responsible or whatever. And then, you know, then from there we used them. You know, we ran all over like the Clarksburg area, Fairmont, Weston, and a few other places. And, uh, you know, brought him in a lot. And then I don't know what, what happened there. And he, years, years later, he started running shows in the Chillicothe and Columbus area. He used me one time out there and never used me again. And I said, geez, that's like something when I helped him get a break and he wouldn't even book me. But it really never mattered to me because I never uh, had an empty calendar. I mean, I, I wrestled up until I was 60 years old and I had cancer, which is what caused me to stop. And now in the meantime, I've gotten two knees replaced and a hip. So, I, you know, I'll probably never go in again or if I do, it'd be limited. But uh, one of the announcers that worked for him said he didn't never want to use me because he's afraid I was going to steal his towns that he was promoting, which, I mean, indie wrestling or outlaw wrestling, I mean, there were so many times available. Plus, I lived in Pittsburgh, which was over 200 miles from from him. So I had no 
thoughts of running, you know, out, out that direction because back in those days, our only publicity was hanging the old Tribune show print uh, posters in the windows and uh, newspaper ads. And then later, once MTV came on, the local stations would let us buy ads, you know, for the commercial time. So that helped increase, you know, a lot of attendance. But uh, why, I mean, why, I have no idea what I did, but I know the Dylan deal, uh, they wanted Virgil for the longest time, but wouldn't make a money offer to bring him in. And I said, well, I wouldn't bring him in for no, you know, taking a chance or whatever. So then finally, uh, Dylan said that, you know, he'd, he'd take care of us or whatever. And I said, well, I'll, I usually never, I never needed the publicity or anything because I had a regular job and I retired now and have a pension. So I never depended on wrestling, you know, in the future, in, you know, now currently to survive. But Virgil, he was only getting $800 a month Social security. So he needed the money or whatever. And he had a big gambling addiction too, which didn't help matters either. But uh, so I agreed to bring Virgil in and then, I said, well, I'm, since I'm coming with him, I said, I might as well paint up and I'll, you know, maybe sell a couple pictures and, and uh, you know, pay for our gas or food or, you know, a hotel or whatever. Because normally when I take Virgil somewhere, I made sure the promoter gave him a decent guarantee plus a hotel and the transportation because, you know, he didn't have any money, so he could never support himself. And I didn't want to be, you know, traveling I took him a lot to New Jersey, like for Tommy Fierro, and uh, I think it was at K&S Wrestling. They did like a online, like autograph session, or which they all all treated him very well. But you know, those were long trips for me. You know, and then he was on the edge of uh, dementia too, and uh, he wouldn't remember things. You know, and I had it was getting to a point where I was babysitting him, plus. Uh, in the car, I'd have to keep repeating myself, and it was just like mentally tiring. And uh, I said, "Yeah, you know, I, I just didn't want to do it no more." And then, then the last straw was uh, Herb Simmons had his big show over in St. Louis, and uh, I was going to take Virgil over there at my own expense. And one of the vendors, which I don't know, somebody told me that Bobby Fulton and Dylan had something to do with it. Uh, talked to, into Herb and he didn't want us then or whatever. So I said, well, well, he didn't want Virgil is what he said. So I said, well, you know, if you're not going to use Virgil, there's no sense of me driving all the way myself or whatever. So I booked us then with uh, Jason Maples down in uh, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And uh, I told Virgil, well, we'll go down there then. And Jason was very uh, cooperative. You know, he was going to make a banner and everything for Virgil. Well, then as we got closer, because Virgil would call me almost every day, and I'd have to repeat the towns and the dates and everything. And uh, he, I said, don't forget, we have pigeon ports. He said, oh, no, I'm in, I'm in St. Louis. I said, well, I already got us booked in pigeon forge. And he said, no, I'm going to St. Louis for... Uh, I forget who who it was even for. Somebody in, like upstate New York. I forget who was booking them. But uh, anytime Virgil was booked, I would have to drive him because he was staying with a roommate that was un, undependable. And, uh, well, it ended up that Virgil never did make it to St. Louis because his roommate, I guess, never took him to the airport or never drove him over there. And then I told Virgil, well, you know, if you want to handle your own bookings or whoever's booking you, go ahead. I don't, you know, I don't really need to be around wrestling too much anymore. Cause like I said, I was getting involved in other, other avenues too, that I wanted to work with. So, so that was like the end of me and Virgil, which was like a year ago. And then I hadn't talked to him, you know, it, it, he even died, you know, and I hadn't talked to him in a year or whatever. So, which I felt bad, but, uh. It was just unfortunate, you know, but then his roommate was telling people I was stealing his money and everything. And he told him, uh, well, Virgil always told me in the car. He said, I, he'd like going with me. He said, I come home with money. He said, so I don't know who was handling them before that, but apparently they, they were taking his money and 
not giving him anything. But then also the roommate, I think, let him stay at his place at no charge. Because when they would get in arguments, the roommate would call me and say, come get Virgil. He can come live with you. I said, no, nah, I'm not a, I'm not a board of wrestlers or whatever. But anyhow, on that same story with Dylan, I said, well, I'll paint my face and, you know, set up, maybe sell a few pictures. And he even made an ad for me or whatever, or a flyer that I posted. And then all of a sudden, I guess they had Sting booked on there. And he said, well, he said, we can't have you painting up or whatever, because Sting's going to be there with a painted face. I said, well, my sales ain't going to affect him at all. And he said, would you want to be here if Dan Housen was here? I said, yeah. I said, it doesn't matter to me. And then he said, I said, well, demolition's there. I said, they paint their faces. He said, oh, well, they paint their face different, you know. Then all of a sudden, Bobby got involved somehow, and they didn't want me around and this and that. And I don't know what the reasoning on that was. But, uh, yeah, so I didn't go then, you know. And it, so I don't know why, you know, what he's all upset about. and you know, Because if I didn't open the door for him in West Virginia, who knows, he may have never gotten into wrestling or it may have been harder for him and when he teamed it they matched him up with tommy rogers the rogers was the whole workhorse of the team i mean with that tommy rogers bobby was just a chubby kid down in west virginia when we used him with mutton chop sideburns and i remember he would even tell me once he did make a big don't don't show nobody those pictures i don't want nobody to see what i used to look like but i mean you know no one you're your pat you never gonna erase anything from the past i mean once that's the way he was but I don't, I don't know what dylan's problem was and then i don't know he i don't know if he was jealous because i was friends with people or or whatever i mean but it's like i've i've only been to two wrestling shows in the last two years and that was uh in iowa iowa at the, uh george tragos luthes hall of fame weekend they do out there and i've only gone to those shows because that's part of the you know the weekend or whatever i haven't been around a wrestling show in ages or whatever not that i don't want to because i still enjoy it i still watch it and i'm still a fan of mark or whatever I, and i think the best guys in wrestling are the guys that grew up following it not just the ones that got in it you know for a payday or a business or whatever and but, uh, yeah, I don't know what their problem was. And then all of a sudden, they started texting me or whatever, all kind of vulgarity and everything, which I still have on my phone. And uh, all I would say back to them is, God bless you. And and supposedly, Bobby's a big Bible thumper or whatever, or so he claims to be. But the language, it was coming. And, and, a, and a few times in a conversation, too, I said, okay, thanks, uh, Bobby. And he said, Oh, no, I said, yeah, I said, thanks, Bob, or, okay, Dylan, because I figured it was Dylan doing the typing, because somebody told me Bobby's uh, technologically sort of illiterate, that he doesn't do anything with the internet or texting or any of that, that it's all Dylan, Dylan running the whole show, so uh, I don't know what's going on there, you know, but... uh yeah, so a few times I said, uh, okay, Dylan, and he said, oh, no, this is Dylan. This this isn't Dylan. This is Daddy. And I said, oh, okay, thanks, Daddy. So I have no idea what, you know, and then he tried calling me a few times. I just blocked his number. I said, I don't have time for that. You know, so. so. So you have a, a geez, I guess we got to call it a 50-year history with Bobby, if you're the guy that helped break him in. Yeah, he used to come, he used to come with a manager named Ken Mick, Playboy Ken Mick, which I believe he's passed away. And then his, Ken's son, Austin Mick, started refereeing and working for Bobby. And then he passed away. I don't know the whole story on that because he would have been pretty young. But, uh, yeah, I don't know what, what he has against me or whatever. It's like an, and I don't know if it's more Dylan, or, and everybody says it's Dylan. A lot of the wrestlers I talked to said they would never work for him again. And some of them that do work for him say that they only go in as a vendor guest. They're, they're not connected with them at all. You know? Well, that's, that's the interesting part about that, uh, 
Ken, it, it, it seems like everybody, you know, good, bad, and indifferent, they love Bobby, and they're pretty much offended by Dylan and his antics, which I find that's that's the word. Everyone who I've spoken to, that's the word that they they consistently put out. We love Bobby. We don't want to work with Dylan. We don't want to deal with Dylan. And, and you know, I, I want to get your take on this since we have you here. Did you hear the second episode that I put out in which Dylan was berating Bobby and, and all that stuff? Did you hear that? Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, which surprised me because if I had talked to my father like that when he was alive, that would be probably the last time I talked at all. You know? But I was surprised to hear that, that he, you know, like, and I've worked, I mean, I've been on shows where Dylan was refer, well, managing, I guess. He managed as a heel. And then uh, the younger son, I think his name's Dylan. No, not Dylan. Uh, Jared. He was a referee or which he's taller than both of them and got a better look than both of them. But I guess he lives with the mother or whatever. And Dylan, I guess, then is with the father. So I, I don't know, you know, why Bobby let him talk like that. He's supposedly a preacher and a God, you know, God believer and everything. But the language that uh, I heard on that, I said, I couldn't believe. And then, and then the recent thing I seen with Lana where I heard that they said somebody ended up punching him or beating him up and he, he shit his pants and, and then called the police. So I don't, I don't know whole, the whole story on that yet, but. Uh, so wait, 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 let's back up for a second. Cause you're, you're, you're breaking some news here. So, so you were were told that who who got who got beat up? Uh, Dylan. I heard. Well, they were doing a thing, I guess, with Lana that uh, C.J. Uh, Perry, uh, uh, the woman yeah. who's formerly known as Lana in, in uh, WWE, right? Yeah. Well, they were doing a thing for two hundred dollars. You can come and have a shot of Fireball with her, and I don't know what else was included. You know, I, I didn't get the whole story, but then. Later, somebody said she was screaming at uh, them, saying she was going to sue them, is what I heard one story was. And then I heard somebody with her end up hitting Dylan, and then they said he ended up shitting his pants or whatever, and he called, oh my God. called the police. So I don't, I haven't got the rest of the story or talked to anybody that was up there, but uh, wow, I heard that from a couple, you know, different reliable sources and. and now, I don't know how true it is, so I don't, you know, want to elaborate too much on it. But I mean, it's probably, probably more will come out eventually. But then all of a sudden, he posted that he's taking a break, a break from wrestling, and he, uh, well, they got something I think in October or something back. They do that once or twice a year. And what Bobby was mad about once too, where he did a, he did a thing where I guess he wrestled Shane Douglas and he juiced and then had pictures from a hospital. He was in a hospital. And I, I told Bobby, I said, Bobby, I said, uh, you're insulting the intelligence of people now because n nobody believes it anymore, knows it's a show. And they know how wrestlers are bleeding now, which you know, in the old days they didn't. I said, uh, you know, show something like that, that you're in a hospital. And, they, and I said, uh, you're insulting the fans, you know, and he was all upset that I'd said that, you know, and I just said, well, I mean, blood blood is like important to a match, but I don't, you know, nowadays I don't know how important it is because no one believes it anyhow. And the stuff they're doing in a ring, I mean, they're just hurting themselves because the people don't believe it anyhow. You know, even like uh, Mania Rock was like whippings with a belt or whatever. I mean, I know that has to hurt or at least sting. I mean, you can see on their backs the marks and everything. And I mean, I. I wrestled the old style, you know, we never did the high flying stunt Cirque du Soleil stuff. And, uh, you know, I had to get two new knees and a hip, but I was lucky that's all I needed so far or whatever. But I mean, I tell a lot of the, and we never had knee pads when I started. So, I mean, that didn't come till years, years later. So we were banging our knees on solid wood. And a lot of times I, when I wrestled in Fort Wayne, Indiana, the first time I wrestled Mike Dupree for, uh, Dick the Bruiser, when I come back to the dressing room, the guy said, uh, what were you doing falling around in there? I said, well, I, said, I wanted to look good. It was my first time in the town. They said, oh, that's a boxing ring. You don't fall down in there. <laughs> so it was like, 
a lot of times we wrestled, you know, probably the floor was softer than, you know, what we was falling on. And a lot of times it was just canvas covering wood. There wasn't even any padding. Years later, then they started putting like rug, that ripple, like rub, rug sponge stuff under the mat or whatever to try to cushion it a little. But a lot of the rings didn't have no bounce or anything. I mean, so that's why you see a lot of these guys at Cauliflower Alley Club and the Iowa Reunion, either in walkers or wheelchairs or limping or, and they have no medical or anything, you know, because not, that's not provided for you once you leave wrestling. A lot of them never realized that, you know, it's going to end one day. Because even guys like Danucci and Cicluna and a few of them, they end up getting jobs with newspaper company in New York to uh, supplement themselves, you know, for medical. And I know Dominic used to drive to New York and he'd stay in New Jersey all week and then drive home on a weekend to see his wife just so he could have medical for the family. And then an income, you know, till I guess he reached you know, retirement age. But, I mean, I, I never wanted to end up like that. I mean, a lot of the guys are making more money now, but it seems like a lot of them are still broke. You know, like, they're asking for GoFundMe to help them, you know, get a hip. Or, and these are guys that were on top, like Scott Hall, the Nasty Boys, Jake the Snake. I mean, <laughs> those are main guys. So you can imagine what the undercard guys, how they're going to end up, you know. And that's why sometimes, too, when you see a lot of suicides or uh, drug problems in wrestling, you realize you know, that that's probably what's causing a lot of it, too. A lot of them are probably in so much pain in that, and some of them probably can't even afford to get medication to help them with pain. And yeah, I just felt sorry for a lot of those guys. So that's why whenever I was promoting, I tried to use a lot of the older guys like Bobo Brazil and Louis Martinez, Dominic you know, anybody that I could help out a little bit, you know, and, but then, you know, a lot of them then got, you know, so bad that, you know, they just stopped, stopped wrestling. I don't know what they did for money then, you know, but a lot of them, but yeah, I don't know what Dylan's problem is, but I don't know. He needs to see somebody, I guess, men, mental health that help or whatever. Well, for, first and foremost, that's a hell of a history lesson that you gave us there. And I appreciate that because you're absolutely right. Um, so many of our, our heroes from yesterday were not prepared for life after wrestling. And it's it's very strange when you see more current wrestlers, even people who you know have, have only been wrestling in the past 10 years, putting up GoFundMes and things like that. So you, you nailed it. You nailed it for sure, Ken. Um, but to, to get back to Dylan... It's very strange to me to watch this young man continue to spiral out of control from my perspective just over the past couple of weeks. I mean, the, the, the little bit of time that I've known of this person since they've been on the show and even going back to when Devon initially spoke openly about his experience with Dylan. Um, every week he, he's getting in a fight with this one and, and he, he's, he seems like he's in a drunken rage over here and somebody caught him cussing out Bobby again. And, you know, now you, you're talking about him having a conflict with Lana, CJ Perry. Uh, somebody allegedly had to put hands on, on Dylan, <laughs> unfortunately. And, and Dylan had a, an accident in his pants and now he's calling the cops and he's taking a break from wrestling. I mean, it, it's almost as if this is like moving on the trashy side of the town. So it's it's <laughs> ironic, <laughs> Ken. It's ironic that <laughs> that Bobby would say that uh, because it, it's almost like he's foreshadowing this 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 spiraling out of control that Dylan is is uh, experiencing. And listen, Dylan, I know that you hate listening to this. Um, when this airs, we're recording it, but it's going to air in, in, in a few days here and you're going to hear it. Uh, Dylan, look, man, just get some help, bro. It's as simple as that to, to speak to your father and tell him that you're nothing ever since you got cancer. There is something tremendously wrong inside of you where you could muster up the audacity to speak to anyone like that, especially your parent. So whatever you're experiencing now that seems like a dark cloud over you, this is what happens. What we put out in the world, unfortunately, we're going to get it right back. And if that's what you're putting out to your own parent, 
then I don't know, brother. I can't imagine how the great spirit in the sky is going to um, correct your behavior. It ain't going to be pretty. And clearly, you, the, the last month that you've had, Dylan, has not been pretty. But I do believe in redemption, and I do believe that everybody deserves an opportunity to reset and correct their behaviors. None of us are perfect, right? We were born imperfect, and we're going to leave this earth imperfect, and that's okay. But we can try our best. And Dylan, it's time for you to start trying your best, because we've seen your worst. Well, I hope we've seen your worst thus far. Ken, you're a gentleman. You're a great guy. I really appreciate you. Uh, I'm hoping on the trash is out of town. <laughs> appreciate you telling us about Ken Jugan. Uh, I, I didn't expect uh, all of that uh, layer of, of history there, which is great because you brought up some of the great names that, you know, we don't want history to forget. Dominic DiNucci and folks like that. Certainly not. Uh, but for you personally, Ken, if, if anyone listening wants to reach out to you and, and see what you're up to these days or what have you, talk a little wrestling, what's the best way that folks can keep up with you? Well, I'm on uh, Facebook under my real name, Ken M. Jugan. And then I'm on Instagram under Zoltan Jugan. So I'd love to talk to anybody and I answer everyone, you know, which I still enjoy talking about wrestling in the old days because that's what I grew up on. And that's why I attend, you know, the reunion in Iowa and the uh, reunion in Vegas because I enjoy seeing a lot of these guys that, you never know who's going to be around from one year to the next, including myself. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's nice to see everybody. And it's like, it's just wild to hear, you know, these accusations from Bobby and, uh, and Dylan. I mean, every parent wants to protect their child. But, I mean, after so many times, I mean, you have to, like, sort of, you know, face the facts that, you know, something's wrong here and take some actions. I mean, because it's probably never going to get better until you know, it's curtailed a little bit but uh yeah it's sad and and yeah i don't hate anybody i mean they i don't know what i did to them but yeah, i mean there's nobody that i hold hold so much animosity against i mean there's a lot of guys even on a regular job that you don't get along with you know people you work with but i mean you tolerate them and there would never be anybody i mean in a dressing room there's were guys that i didn't care to be around and, and I would still work with them professionally in the ring. But, I mean, yeah, I never hated them. You know, I, mean, I don't know what, you know, for being such a believer in God and that to, you know, hate's a strong word. I mean, it's, I don't know. But I guess I'm from the trashy side of time. So <laughs> I don't know what to tell you there. Yeah. Strictly for the culture. Brothers and sisters, you have seen the t-shirts, the hats, the hoodies, the mugs in the hands of some of your favorite pro wrestling stars, podcasters, and influencers out there. And now it's time. Visit strictlyfortheculture.ca and you too can be part of the movement. Bigger than sweatshirts and commercial success, Strictly for the Culture aims to build with like-minded people and elevate their position in the world through knowledge, self-love, and a desire to unite. So what are you waiting on? Visit strictlyfortheculture.ca. Do it for the love. Do it for the knowledge. Most importantly, folks, do it strictly for the culture. So next time, folks, be kind to yourselves and be kind to others. Take it away, Tony Schiavone. This is Tony Schiavone, and we're desperately out of time on Duke Love Wrestling.